And if it makes you a little bit nervous, it's probably going to be great. Yeah, draw the line at panic. If you start to panic, probably a bad idea. But if you can anywhere between I'm bored and a little nervous, you're going in the right direction. Okay, welcome again, everybody, to another episode of the Destination Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Stoker. And glad to be back with kind of a normal episode this week. Thanks for bearing with me last week as I was recording from home. Uh, although it was fun to kind of get to know Kyle and, and learn a little bit about the the man behind the computer here uh, who puts a lot of the episodes together, uh, does a lot of editing work, has to edit out a bunch of the weird, dumb, annoying stuff that I say. And so it's nice to have him <laughs> pr- protecting my reputation a little bit there on, on, the, on the editing. So... Uh, thanks, Kyle, for for being with us last week. And we've got another great guest for you guys today. And I touched a little bit on uh, on this guest and, and that I was excited to bring him on. You know, we haven't talked PR a lot. And today we have Life Pedersen. Life, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, we're excited to have you on. We're going to talk. We're going to dive into all things PR. But you have, I, I read your bio uh, that, that you've got on your LinkedIn page. And for anybody that hasn't seen Life's bio, you need to go check it out because that alone, it's like a podcast episode in its entirety, <laughs> just reading that thing. So I want to talk about a few things in there if that's okay. But first, every single episode, uh, we always ask people, you know, and, and you're a pretty well-traveled guy, so you're going to have some good answers to this. But if you could go anywhere in the world, what's your dream destination? Okay, well, that I mean, that changes from moment to moment. But at the at the at this moment, I am plotting to finally get to Argentina. Um, not original. I just I've never found the time and and had the you know the ability to you know take the time off, but also have the money. I always either have too much time. And not enough money, or the other way around. And you know, so Argentina, I want to go there, do it right, like for like three weeks. Um, I'm also, I haven't been to, uh, strangely enough, because we're going to talk about this later. I haven't been to Romania in almost ten years, and I really miss it. And I would love to go back there. Okay, all right. Is that so? Leading into our next question, is that your favorite place you've ever visited? Oh, I have a very complicated emotional relationship with Romania. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a it's a fantastic place to visit. Um, it's a challenging place to live, and I did live there for about a year and a half. Um, and most of that time was before they joined the European Union, so things were a little less um, reliable in terms of you know being like hot water being available on every day, stuff like that. The internet just disappearing. So uh, I, I lived there during a, a challenging time. I, I by all accounts. It's much better. The food is good. Um, you know, back even just 10 years ago, you didn't eat food in Romania for enjoyment. You just ate it to forestall death. You know, there was no, there was no joy in the food. And now it's just, it's having this huge uptick and, um, yeah, now they just need the tourism people to, to show up. Okay. So you, you want to go experience the, the other side of Romania, maybe the, the more enjoyable side, it sounds like. I haven't done a trip around Romania just for pure, um, for pure leisure in, in more than a decade. Uh, actually, I, I'm going to say it was 2005 the last time I did that. Every other time has been work related. So yes, I, I want to go and be a tourist and, and revisit the country where I've spent the most time outside of the United States. Awesome. Okay. And and you brought up Argentina and you said you need three weeks to do it right. Minimum. What are the major milestones or the, the major uh, attractions that you would have on your list if you were go to, to go to Argentina? Uh, this isn't very original at all. I, I'm a big fan of beef and I'm a big fan of red wine and I just want to just you know, swim through that stuff all the way back and forth across the whole country. And, you know, so you need at least three weeks for that. Got it. Okay. I want all beef, right, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I want wine all, all day long. I want like a camelback of red wine that's just on me at all times. And then just, I'm, I mean, I'm sure there's worthwhile tourism stuff to do, and I haven't done the legwork for that. But you never, you can't have a conversation about Argentina without hearing about the beef and the wine. And I've been hearing about this for 20 years now. I've got, I've just got to, one of these days, I got to set that time aside and go do it. And see, I was thinking we were going to go down the vegetarian tourism path today. And it sounds like maybe we're not going to talk that much about vegetarian tourism. Uh, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I mean, I'll eat a vegetable if it's hidden in amongst other beef. Um, but, uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of vegetables, but uh, yeah, no, I'm, I am, uh, far from a vegetarian. If I don't have some sort of meat based protein, I get a little twitchy. 
Okay, got it. That's good. Meat tourism, huge marketing opportunity uh, for the persona of Life Pedersen. So right. There if you we need go. A, if you need a guy that is just absolutely insatiable, I'm I'm and you guess and the money to send him somewhere, I'm your guy. I only weigh 160 pounds, but you will be shocked at how much I can eat. <laughs> how much beef you can put down. Exactly. <laughs> got it. <laughs> well, so outside of beef. There, there's more to your background, right? So We haven't life, even gotten us, to my background. We haven't even done it yet. Tell us a little bit about who you are. And, you know, you've obviously done a lot of work with destinations. Uh, touch a little bit on the personal and the professional. T- just tell us about who you are. So um, the reason why my LinkedIn thing seems like it's a, a big saga, it's because, you know, I'm old. I'm, I'm 49. I'm knocking on the door of 50. I've just had a lot of time to do these things. Um, and f- until I was uh, 33, I didn't even work in tourism. I worked for the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. I was an electronic payments analyst. Um, it wasn't until 2003 when I um, when I did the story that you read about a lot now. I, I had a little lifestyle crisis. I quit my job, sold everything, just liquidated everything I had. So I had all the cash. I bought my first laptop ever and uh, some other tech, good camera. And I just hit the road. I had no writing experience. I had no connections. I just, I thought, well, you know, worst case scenario, I uh, spend a couple of years traveling the world and then I go back to work at the Federal Reserve Bank. But um, uh, when you do nothing but travel and write for months and months straight, um, you you know, despite having zero experience, I, I just sort of by accident got good at it. Wow. Okay. That's, that's a pretty unique path, right? From banking right. to... <laughs> to writing and traveling and PR, uh, what like what and convincing people that catalyst? bad grammar wasn't uh, you know a disqualifier for being a travel writer because <laughs> you should have seen some of my early stuff. But you know a lot of the editors were very um, forgiving because I was able to make I was able to inject humor in pretty much any scenario. So even the driest content I could just sort of liven it up so people wouldn't start skimming. That that's great stuff. Before before we get more into your writing, I just got to know. What was the catalyst? What caused you to say, I'm doing it and, and, and made you dive in? You know, um, I, there was a lot of things going on back then. You know, I had been recently divorced, but more than that, I'd been working at the Federal Reserve Bank for nine years. Uh, I was a theater major in college, and then I ended up as an electronic payments um, analyst. You know, you can just see the the <laughs> growing, you know, just the, the collision was going to happen sooner or later with me going... I hate this. Why, why is it taking me so long to figure this out? So, uh, yeah, I just, I you know, back in 2003, you could sell a house for a huge profit. I don't know if you remember that, but it was fan. I'd only owned the house for three years and I sold it for um, 100%. You know, I, I doubled my money. I wow. I put a lot of sweat into that house. It needed a lot of work, so it wasn't like I just sat there and and scooped in the cash. I that house needed everything done to it. But yeah, so after I sold that house, I had a, a very very nice nest egg. And um, you know, most people don't have that opportunity. But you know, I'd worked uh, very diligently at, for nine years and saved all that up, and I got very lucky with the housing market. And so I I realized one day I was like, I can do whatever I want. You know, I've got, I've got the money. I I can, I can literally do whatever I want for the first time in my life. So, um, yeah, I, I did, I followed through on that and I lived the dream. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's Although, great. you know, the dream or and, never. Yeah. Well that, well, no people, even then people are like, you're doing this at age 33. You are ruining your life. What are you going to do about health insurance? You're never, you're never going to get your career back. What are you insane? Oh, my whole family, everyone I knew, they were pretty sure I was going to die out there. And it's just like, I'm just going to go backpacking. So, well, let's let's talk about some of the places you went. Uh, where, where did you go? And then a- as you go through that, tell me a little bit about how that morphed into PR. Well, um, uh, the... Goal was to just cover as much territory as possible. I had, I wanted to be a travel writer, and I had no experience writing. And, you know, I had done some backpacking in a few countries, but I just didn't have the destinations under my belt that I needed. I didn't have the expertise anywhere, you know. Um, so I, uh, I just, I hit the road hard. I covered uh, a lot of Western and, and Central Europe the first year, and then I uh, spent my first summer in Romania, and then after that, um, I, I bolted off to Australia, New Zealand, Southeast Asia. And by that time, you know, it had been a year and into my little adventure and I'd already gotten a few clippings and I had a couple of clients. And so the, I, I already had some work that 
I got paid to do some work in Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia. And it just sort of was, you know, slowly building like any normal resume process. And uh, yeah. Y- yeah, so, um, you know, name, there's like, the only country in Western Europe I still haven't been to is Finland. I just, I cannot, I don't know why I can't get there. Um, but, uh, you know, I've covered a lot of those countries in Southeast Asia. And yeah, I was just, I was doing it, you know, for two reasons. Like I said, to get the destinations on my belt, but I just wanted to see the planet, you know. I'd, I'd seen, I mean, even though I'd been, you know, um, uh, fortunate enough to, to see some of Europe already. I, uh, I wanted to get, I wanted to get it all under my belt. If it was going to be a, a, a limited adventure and I was going to have to end up back at the federal reserve in a couple of years, I had a lot of territory to cover. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And, and while you were traveling, did you join a circus or <laughs> tell me a little bit about how you got the talents of juggling and escaping a straight jacket and did those happen at the same time or was that spread out in different destinations how did this happen i, I can't tell you the story about escaping straight jacket until certain legal things are resolved but i started juggling <laughs> i started juggling when i was a little kid when i was 12 i saw another little kid who was even younger than me juggling on tv and i was like well if that stupid little kid can do it then i and it turns out that little kid turned into one of the greatest jugglers in the history of of humanity so i you know I was inspired by the right people. And I saw, taught myself how to juggle. I did it all through high school, college. Um, I did it professionally for a while, but juggling professionally, you know, if you do anything you love for money, it just stops being stuff that you love. It just becomes work. So yeah. um, I, I backed off from performing professionally and I just became a hobbyist. Um, and I've been doing it now for 30 th- th- something years. And um, I've competed in the world championships twice now in, in my 40s, which is not the age when people uh, do a <laughs> do a co- competition that's so physically and mentally taxing. I mean, most jug- juggling is kind of like a lot of Olympic sports. By the time you get to your mid to late 20s, you're done, you know. And so to compete, that old, uh, you know, I had to do, I had to to do a lot of training, but also, you know, I had to take into account the fact that I was old and I, you know, could hurt myself a lot easier and I got tired a lot faster and things like that. But um, the uh, straight jacket uh, was, it's actually a very simple story. I just needed to make my show longer back in the nineties. I needed to add some time that wasn't just me juggling because that's exhausting. So uh, I needed something where I was standing and not juggling and talking and the straight jacket was it. So I, uh, I found, uh, I found a straight jacket which is not easy to do and uh, I worked it into my act and uh, uh, the rest is history that's that's amazing so but we if had... I ever get snapped up I am not going to be there for long if I the padded room cannot hold me <laughs> well and and from the sounds of it that's good because you you can't stay in one place for very long <laughs> right well that used to be the case you know I'm, I'm almost 50 now I'm kind of a homebody believe it or not I, I'm sitting in my living room now and this is pretty much where I'm happiest Nice. Well, I guess when you've seen the whole world, uh, much of the yeah. world, I have barely <laughs> stepped foot in Africa, you know, and, and South America, you know, I still have a lot of territory to cover there, but you know, I'm, I've, I've, I've got to, I've got to earn money and pay the mortgage. So, you know, there's a certain balance that I have to keep now that I didn't have to think about back in the, in the, uh, the salad days of my little golden nest egg that I had and, and very little responsibility. Nice. Well, just so you know, and we, we haven't talked about this ahead of time, but I also have the ability to juggle, probably not at the talent <laughs> level that you are from the sounds of it. I will not be competing in the world championships at any point in my life, but I can juggle and I can ride a unicycle, but I can't do oh. the two things at the same time. Can't do it. I can barely do that myself. But hey, uh, you know, any level of juggling is good for the brain. I don't know if you've done the research because nobody has, but I'll just uh, ask you that question out of politeness. Um, but I, <laughs> I've i learned over the years that juggling is actually extremely good for the brain. It's one of the only things that, um, that they've studied. It's probably not the only thing, but it's the only thing that they've studied that shows that actual gray and white matter growing as you uh, learn how to juggle and continue juggling. You, it, juggling literally makes you smarter. So, um, Adam, you've, you've chosen well, and I encourage you to keep doing that uh, uh, so that, um, you know, when you get older, you're still sharp. Yeah. You know, my wife would say I probably need to juggle more often then. <laughs> she's probably and, got a lot of on her mind right now. She, she doesn't need to worry about that. Well, yeah, she's, you know, she's, she's actually at the hospital with our, with our baby right now. And so, right. yeah, she, she's got a lot going on. Let's dive into PR. Uh, and, and before we dive specifically into it, 
you've written a couple of books and I want to have you just kind of tell me a little bit about both of those books. And then I want to talk about destinations and really give our listeners uh, the specific value of PR strategy for their destination and, and some ideas and tools they can use. But tell us about your books because I think they're both really interesting. <laughs> so since we're talking about juggling, my most recent book is called uh, Throwing Up, Notes from 35 Years of Juggling. Uh, I just... I, there was no juggling memoirs out there, and I noticed there was memoirs for like clowns and um, embroiderers and, and tennis players, you know. So I thought, well, juggling needs a memoir, so here I go. And uh, I wrote that knowing that it would be a very small audience, but it's surprise. It's shockingly, be, being a, a book about juggling and self-published, it's selling pretty well. I'm kind really? of shocked. Yeah, I thought I would only sell it at like juggling festivals and stuff like that. But um, no, my, my online sales have been pretty steady. Uh, my first book, which is travel related, is called Backpacking with Dracula. And that is um, all based on my time working and living in Romania with, and uh, about Vlad the Impaler, the 15th century prince of Wallachia, which is in modern day Romania, who was well known for being uh, kind of a psychopath, but also he's considered a hero for Romania since he single-handedly held off the Ottoman Empire from invading Christian Europe for several years. And, you know, traveling and working in Romania, I visited all these surviving sites associated with Vlad the Impaler. And, you know, from there it was, I finally had to read the, the Dracula novel, of course. And I, so the book is a half history about Vlad the Impaler, how he kind of reappeared in modern times as a as a blood sucking monster but also it's a travel memoir cuz i as a travel uh, as a lonely planet guidebook author in a country uh, you know just before they joined european union you can imagine uh, i had certain challenges getting around and getting my job done so there's a that's kind of uh, the, the love hate relationship with romania is very clearly spelled out there at great length uh, but yeah so that's uh, I, I did the, i finally did a travel memoir and that's also doing well it tends to sell well around halloween <laughs> between Halloween and Christmas, everybody wants the Dracula book. But uh, yeah, so uh, that uh, another book that I self-published, um, even though you know vampires were out and it was all about zombies, uh, I've managed to convince people to to learn more about the the actual Dracula. And can our listeners find those books on Amazon? Yes, both of them. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll we'll have to have our listeners check that out and post in the LinkedIn group, uh, Destination Marketers LinkedIn group what they thought of the book. So I'll get back to you with some feedback. All right. And you know, Halloween's coming up. You got to, you got to get your Halloween, whatever bags or stockings, whatever you do and fill them with Dracula books. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Perfect. Which is what everybody wants. They want to read instead of eat candy. I, I don't know. I'm... <laughs> I wish my kids would read instead of eating candy. Well, they need this book, although it is, <laughs> it is a PG-13 topic. There's a lot of violence. So uh, maybe, okay. maybe give them some time. Yeah, we'll give them a couple years. Yeah. Hey, let's talk about destinations and PR. It's so hard to stand out. It's so hard, especially with with destinations. One of the things that that I've seen is it's difficult to create urgency. In, in, in what I mean by that is, you know, the media outlets know that your destination isn't going anywhere. So unless you've got some event, <laughs> or unless you've got, uh, you know, a whole like like the eclipse is is only visible from your destination uh, or something like that. It's really hard to get that news coverage that you're looking for. So tell us a little bit about what you've seen, how you've been able to get some coverage for destinations and, and we'll go from there. Well, uh, you, you probably covered this in previous episodes, but as you just uh, mentioned, there, there has to be a hook. There has to be a, 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 a peg, which we use. It's like a time or event-related uh, um, issue going on. So we call that a peg in travel writing. That's that's the peg, like uh, the Super Bowl happening in your town or something like that. That's the peg. Um, but uh, also, yeah, there, there has to be something. They're just not going to, if you send out, and blizzard everyone with information about what hotel got a new pool or some place that's reopening after renovations. Uh, that's you're right. It's going to be virtually impossible outside of a few maybe niche um, publications to or outlets to get anybody chattering about that. There has to be. Well, why is this important now, or why is this relevant now? And so, and you know, there isn't. Most destinations don't have 
an answer to that on a monthly basis or even an annual basis. You know, uh, I live in Minneapolis and Minnesota, and we are, I'm not afraid to say, maybe one of the greatest destinations in the country. But <laughs> that's my slightly bias. I've from- been there. I actually agree. And you've got the best airport in the United States. Don't we? States. It is yes, not only is do. it great to hang out, but it's so easy to get to. I live in downtown Minneapolis. It costs two dollars to get out there. It takes twenty two minutes. There is no other airport that I've been to in the United States that costs that little and you can get to that fast on public transport. I just had to throw that out there. Yep, I love so, it. So um but even Minneapolis, you know, we're in the Midwest. We're still people joke about how, you know, we ride um, moose and trade animal pelts or whatever. You know, there's snow on the ground eight months a year. So there's there's um uh, stuff like that that we're battling, but there isn't there isn't something that it's going to get somebody to write about it. Uh, just because oh Minneapolis is this happening place, you still need something else there. Why is this important now? Um, so that is if you don't have that, you have to get extremely creative. So let's talk about getting creative then, because I you're, you're headed exactly where I want to go. Uh, there are things that destinations can do to create, I'm going to coin a word here, newsworthiness. Is that a word? Newsworthiness? I think so. Okay. All right. Good. Then I didn't coin it. Uh, It (laughs) should be if it's not, right? Exactly. Uh, But but there's things that destinations can do outside of having an event. How do you get the story to be interesting enough for somebody to want to publish it? So there's there's two things at play here. If um, if you want to get into a certain publication, you're just going to have to be laser focused on what that their readers are into, what their demographics are. I mean, this is uh, again, this is pitching 101 for a travel writer when they're tr- pitching magazines or even websites now, um, since magazines and printed are all closing shop. The San Francisco Chronicle, a, a newspaper I contributed to, the travel section uh, just finally closed down after, uh, I mean, and it was a very good travel section and now they're just gone. You know, it's it's a, it's heartbreaking. Um, my Minneapolis Star Tribune here has got a pretty good travel section that's still going along. They have a full-time editor, but you know, these things are closing down around the country and you have to, you have to take into account um, the format or the platform, which now is almost always going to be digital, um, who that's going to appeal to. And, and if you're going to target one place like BuzzFeed, you've got to just got to just make it absolutely irresistible to that platform. But if you're um, casting a wide net, then um, there's all kinds of creativity out there. If, if you can do something that just gets attention, something goofball, especially people, you know, will glom onto that. And I'm sure you're um, familiar with Nebraska's uh, somewhat recent uh, campaign, Nebraska. It's not for everybody, right? And it got yep. worldwide coverage. It was so good. And um, I actually interviewed um, Nebraska Tourism's uh, um, CEO or president uh, on my podcast, Passport Marketing uh, PR Podcast, and um, he he was a very he was a talker. <laughs> we got a lot of long stories, but it was fascinating just the way you know nebraska the things that they have to do to to gain attention and the risks they're willing to take which is rare in in travel um or destination marketing a lot of people their their reputation and and keeping all this you know they're trying to satisfy people from ages three to 93 and you can't offend anybody or and and they're just so overly careful with missteps that they ironically that kind of leads them to failure yep everything kind of becomes so vanilla right if you're not if you're not telling a story and you're not if you're not afraid to be different and stand out right right exactly you i mean the failure is going to happen one way or another and i think too many you know cvbs and and other pr folks the the suggestion that failure is just uh we can't it's got to work it's got to work at least a little bit and then so they don't take risks uh i th- i feel like failure and and i'm not alone here i think failure is just a learning opportunity you figured out what worked and you apply it to the next thing you know maybe maybe you spent a couple ten thousand dollars whatever um but you learned a lesson i i don't think failure should be a disqualifier i i think Creativity and guts uh, will, will go a long way, and, and Nebraska ha- has proven that. Yeah, I think Nebraska is a great example. I, I was I was going to ask you if you heard about. Uh, are you familiar with Snowbird Resort here in Utah? No, I'm not much of a skier though. Snowbird Resort is is one of the, in my opinion, best ski resorts in the country, and they they did something really interesting. And their agency, who wasn't who wasn't us at Relic, but it was another agency here in Utah that does brilliant work. And they they were looking through the reviews that Snowbird had gotten uh, 
on on Google and they looked at the reviews and there was a couple like all the reviews are amazing. And then there's a couple of one star reviews. And so they looked at this and they said, what if we took the one star review that says the <laughs> terrain is too expert? It was too hard and I fell down and they take that. And, and I can't remember exactly what the, what it said. I, I, I should pull it up here. But they put they made it a huge print ad with a picture of the mountain with just the review and the one star. That's, that's brilliant. And I've never seen a print ad get so much media coverage <laughs> as that one. I mean, it was on the cover of Ad Age for a minute. It was, I mean, it was one of the best PR campaigns and it was tied to traditional advertising, right? They did something completely different, completely out of the box. And now everybody was telling the story as a result. Uh, so anyway, sa- same type of thing, right? Yeah, um, I mean they they took a risk. It, I mean it probably didn't even cost them that much to to test it out, and then when it took off, that's just that's just free money. Um, and you know, there's all kinds of examples of that. If you don't have a, a a peg to work with, you can make your peg by doing something weird or unusual or goofball. I mean, people love goofball. Yeah, which is why I've well, been so successful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know and I which is that. why you're a great interview on the podcast, by the way. <laughs> I, I did something similar. Um, and it was, you know, I this was back when I was tourism communications manager for Mall of America. I You probably heard about it, maybe. Um, we needed something. There was, I we needed something to happen that year. And um, I was trying to figure out a way to get a lot of attention for very little money. And I'd seen that, you know, like Heathrow Airport had done a writer in residence and Amtrak had done a writer in residence. And I was like, okay, how about writer in residence at the largest mall in North America? Uh, people are going to either love that or hate that. Either way, they're going to talk about it. And they, I was right. You know, um, we did a little contest. There was, um, oh, golly, there was four. 1,400 uh, submissions for people to be the writer in residence at Mall of America. Um, they would, you know, they would get all expenses paid travel, hotel and whatever, and they just had to sit in the mall and and write. And it got coverage, you know, it wasn't all positive coverage because, you know, <laughs> even people here in Minnesota are kind of like, Ugh, Mall of America, why? But <laughs> got people talking. And for, you know, I think we spent less than $5,000. We got we got global coverage for that. Wow. And, that's, and, see, that's, that's great. And that was the contest. When the guy actually showed up and did his thing they got you know not not quite as much coverage but still a lot of free coverage just uh, because they ended up picking this poet who wrote poems for people like custom poems right on the spot he had a little old dinky old-timey typewriter and he would write poems people would just come up sit down they'd talk for a few minutes he'd write them a poem and so that that took off again and they got they got even more um exposure so i think takeaway here then in in this specific discussion is get creative and create your own peg whether that's from a messaging standpoint whether it's from like a a unique storytelling angle uh, or or a stunt even of some sort like like you did with having this guy come in and and be a, a live-in writer in the Mall of America. Uh, right. You know, Finland has the um, the Air Guitar Championships over the year, I'm, and that always gets coverage. Things like that, you know. Um, it's it's going to, you know, if people try too hard, it, it loses its its punch. But if, you, if you're if you diligent about it, and, you know, I you, obviously I even stole the idea from other folks, but, you know, I made it my own. You, you just take little pieces of things that you like, you know, swirl it around, make a little, put in the blender, make it um, relevant to your destination and then put it out there. Worst case scenario, it goes nowhere. You spend a few thousand dollars. Um, you learned what doesn't work and then you move on to the next thing. And, and PR, much like marketing, you either, it's either a success or you learn. There's no such thing as failure. And I, I think you mentioned that earlier. I think it's I, great, great advice. I, I, yes. And I, and I, th- I, th- don't think is that as as rare as I'm making it sound, but there. I mean, I just encounter so many destinations that that view failure as. I mean, they they've got people to answer to. There just cannot be failure because it'll. Um, you know, the people up, you know, three or four levels above their pay grade will will get upset with them, and maybe it'll affect their budget. I mean, I don't know. They've they've got people to answer to, um, and it just makes them close down, um, and rather than just you know pitch this idea to them with supporting evidence, you can just go, hey, look at what. Nebraska did. Look what Finland did. Look what Mall of America did. And uh, I'd like to do something like this. And only a lunatic would say, no, 
I don't think that's a good idea. Well, we'll just keep on going with the print ads that show, you know, canoeing or whatever. Well, the, the, the trick is look at things that have been successful and don't just copy and do the same thing, right? But create your own spin, which is what you did at the Mall of America. It's what Nebraska did, uh, you know, to... to you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, I, I have you seen uh, every year on ESPN, they feature there's there's a I can't remember what the country is that does this, but they 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 have people that stand at the top of a hill and they try to race a wheel of cheese <laughs> yeah. to the bottom of a hill. That's have you somewhere, seen that? That's somewhere in the UK. I can't remember. I mean, I want to say Wales or Scotland, one, one of those places. But yeah, I, I, every yeah, I've seen that video in, or a video with with that kind of footage dozens of times. Well, and it's every year. ESPN covers this every year because it's weird and and also you're kind of wondering if somebody's going to get really hurt rolling down that hill but but it's a unique thing that gets people talking right even if it's weird and zany like you're saying you said people like goofball right and and there's multiple examples of how that works right exactly and you know if if you can't if, if if goofball is not your thing or you did something goofball last year and you're taking some downtime you know um there are other ways to do that and and my favorite exa- recent example of that is what pure michigan has been doing on their social media they've um they've had very successful social media that has driven their uh, website traffic through the roof um and if you know if you can't do like a a, a stunt or whatever you know something a, a campaign like we've been talking about um doing something just different in in your social media um just and and again um taking risks is is what it's all about no one's gonna pay more attention to you because you do something a little different i don't know if you've um seen um photos uh the the guidebook photos uh twitter stream in the past year or so they've uh they've um revived um mr Foder, whatever i forget his first name and and he's pretending to be this ancient old Twitter novice and it's just it's hilarious it's super funny and and he every every day it's it's some other thing that he's discovering learning how to use Twitter or, or traveling in the modern age and I, I love it and another example I used in a pre- previous presentation they don't have the same um, social media manager anymore but um, Webster's dictionary for a very long time had this social media person that was just on doing these excellent tweets that were usually tied to some goofball political or you know current events thing and it would they would they would find a word that is that it was associated with that give the definition of that word and and tie it into whatever you know current event thing and it was always very funny and clever and they would just those tweets would run wild oh that's great yeah that, there's dozens of examples hundreds of examples right of it, the trick is to just do it right don't don't sit there and wait for the best idea in the world to come to you try something take take action right and if it makes you a little bit nervous, it's probably going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Politics and religion, the two things you probably want to stay away from. But other than that, yes, I would right. agree with you. Yeah. If, I mean, yeah, draw the line at panic. If you start to panic, probably a bad idea. But if you can anywhere between I'm bored and a little nervous, you're, 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 you're going in the right direction. I like it. Well, tell me, you, you've obviously been out there and seen a lot. Tell me some of the mistakes that you've seen that, that you feel like our listeners would want to avoid. Oh, boy, there's goodness. Um, well, uh, one, one mistake, which is um, uh, I've seen now twice, which really irritates me um, because it's so basic. Uh, a, a certain state, a certain couple of states now have put out... Um, new video campaigns, just just giving the destination marketing thing in, in some high production value video, right? And the video's got like people pouring wine and laughing in a cabin and maybe walking, you know, playing with a dog and it's like, and then you get to the end of the video and you realized, where was that? That could have been, if it the logo of the place hadn't been in the lower right hand corner of the video that could have been anywhere they spent all this money on a video that could have been literally anywhere and no one's going to travel to your state when your state has the exact same stuff that their state is it they're just going to stay in their own state and so um, you know the the, um i don't want to say who it is the first time i did this i used this in a in a presentation but it wasn't until um almost two minutes into their 
uh, video that they showed like a five minute, no, I'm sorry, a five second clip of something that was definitely that destination. Like, oh, I know where that is. But it wasn't until then, it, it, I mean, until then it could be, you know? So uh, I just, it just drove me crazy that we had to sit that long and, and watch people pour wine and it could have been anywhere. And and, and well, now another the, state the has just done that, that I, that I won't name, but it rhymes with um, Frinnesota. <laughs> Is it Skinnesota? It might be Skinnesota. Yeah, I, I, I I'll have to go back to the state. Though. I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to out them. But if you look at their recent uh, campaign, uh, with the exception, I think of one video that I, I actually quite like. Uh, the rest of them is just like, where is this? This could be anywhere. This is this. You know, it could be Nebraska. It could be in Alaska. It could be Finland, or it could be Minnesota. You know, you don't know. Well, you're touching on a problem though that I think a lot of our listeners have, and that's that there are so many stakeholders and hands hands on the pot saying we want you to do it this way and we want you to feature us and there's restaurants that want to be featured and there's there's you know hot springs there's there's so many different things within a destination they become like these these collages a video collage of everything you could possibly do when in fact there's only one or two things in most destinations that makes them completely unique and and to your point you've got to focus on what makes your destination unique. And then once they get there, focus on dispersing that traffic throughout the destination so that the people who came for one thing have the opportunity to experience the other components of a destination. Right? Exactly. Um, and that's, uh, that's a good, uh, that brings me back to mall of America. Now the mall of America is not for everyone, but it does bring in, over 40 million visitors a year. And a lot of them are from out of state and international travelers. And um, it breaks my heart, but some people, yes, they just come in, they visit the mall, they go shopping, and then they go home. That that makes me want to tear what little hair I have out of my head. Um, but... <laughs> You know, a lot of those people they stay. They they come into Minneapolis and St. Paul. They'll they'll go uh, to northern Minnesota to the Boundary Waters. Um, they'll do other stuff. So uh, the mall, the you know, Mall of America was the weird gargantuan thing that brought them here. But then, yeah, they uh, the the ones that actually have an interest in something other than shopping, they they kind of spill out and they see the rest of the state. And that uh, you're opinions about shopping malls notwithstanding that has done been a huge boom for minnesota tourism life it's been great to have you you've given us some great insight uh here today especially for people struggling to understand how to tell their story and stand out from the crowd uh i I think there's so much value in that and and a lot of the things that you've told us today i think will benefit our audience so thanks my pleasure i i can't you can't stop me from talking about this as you've seen (laughs) it's a topic i'm I'm still very um attached to because you know i find that exciting i uh, tourism is one of the the few things that whatever it is if it's a cruise ship if it's a mall if it's canoeing in the boundary waters whatever is making people happy that's the most important thing you're trying to make people happy and so i think tourism is extremely important because we all need that recharge and uh so one one way or another you know it's we've we've got to make sure that we're there's some sort of outlet for people to kind of like just step away from their lives do something super fun awesome whatever that makes them happy and then and then come home recharged yeah what a gratifying industry to be in right it is well everyone this has been another episode of the destination marketing podcast thank you so much for tuning in a reminder to go in we've had several new people join the LinkedIn group, Destination Marketers. Go join, share your knowledge. We just had a new video posted yesterday that had some great information about social media uh, and tactics that you can use there. Let's continue to grow together, learn together. Go request to join Destination Marketers on LinkedIn. And other than that, we'll talk to you next week. 